Good evening to those of you in the UK and Buenos Tardes for those in Ecuador. Welcome to our webinar focused on protecting the birds of Galapagos. I'm Charmian Keynes and I'm Chair of the Galapagos Conservation Trust. I'm delighted that so many of you are able to join us tonight, both existing GCT supporters and partners, as well as a number of you who are new to GCT's events. We have an exciting evening lined up, um, but before moving on to that, I would like to mention just a couple of housekeeping points. Firstly, to one side of your screen, you should see chat and question tabs. For the Q&A section of this webinar, please use the question tab. For other comments or general chat, please use the chat tab. Secondly, we are also using, or we're also running a poll, so please, please do take part in this during the event. It should be available from now. Let's get going. So in these challenging times with ongoing war in Europe, we're pleased to be able to provide some lighter relief by sharing with you the exciting work that we're doing in Galapagos to protect some of its rarest species of bird life. Our focus tonight is on the land birds of Galapagos, from Darwin's finches to the bright and colourful little vermilion flycatcher. Land birds such as the finches and the mockingbirds inspired Charles Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, and they continue to contribute to science today. These iconic species are still evolving, adapting to food availability and changes in climate. They are, however, under threat. The introduction of invasive species such as the avian vampire fly, feral cats and blackberry plants are devastating these bird populations by infesting nests, eating young and reducing foraging and nesting opportunities. Invasive species combined with climate change and increasing humans' presence are putting huge pressure on the endemic birds of Galapagos to the point where some of these populations are hanging by a thread. Thankfully, as we'll hear from today's experts, there are some efforts to improve the situation. So Jen Jones, GCT's Head of Programmes, will first give us an overview of the key threats, look at how GCT has been supporting land bird conservation over the years and explore what the future looks like. Roland Digby, Floriana Mitigation Officer at the Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust, will then talk about one of the most ambitious projects that GCT currently supports, the restoration of the whole of Floriana Island. Floriana, which is home to around 140 people, has seen 13 local extinctions thanks to invasive species, with a further 55 species threatened. By eradicating invasive species and reintroducing some of these locally extinct species, the project aims to be the world's first large inhabited tropical island to have its habitat restored and species reintroduced to it, thereby acting as a template for other conservation projects globally. This, by the way, is something GCT likes to do more generally. Finally, Birgit Fessel, coordinator of the Galapagos Land Bird Conservation Plan at the Charles Darwin Foundation, will talk about the work being done to save some of Galapagos's rarest birds with GCT support the mangrove finch, which only has a population of around 100 individuals, and the little vermilion flycatcher, you can see here, which has significantly reduced populations on inhabited islands and is nearing extinction on Santa Cruz. Both species are threatened by invasive species, and Birgit will describe how the teams are working to improve these species' chances of survival. While great steps have been taken to protect the rare birds of Galapagos, there's still a long way to go, and we continue to need your support as we seek with our partners to restore the habitat of Galapagos and provide these species with the environment they need to thrive. So please do donate to our Restoring Habitats appeal by using the link in the box that's popping up now or in the chat. And thank you in advance, and I do hope you enjoy the talks. Let me now pass to Jen Jones, Head of Programmes at GCT. Hey. So I would like to start by thinking a little more deeply about biodiversity in general. So what is biodiversity? Habitats of any kind that you can think of have native species assemblages. From microbes, bacteria, viruses that we're unfortunately familiar with these days, um, to small invertebrates, so zooplankton in the sea, insects, in the terrestrial environment, crabs, sea stars, sea cucumbers, fish, amphibians, reptiles, of course, and what we celebrate a lot in Galapagos. So our iconic giant tortoise um, connection is proudly displayed in many logos of organizations working there, including GCT. The land iguanas and marine iguanas capture uh, everybody's imagination these relics of the past, these dragon-like creatures. And now snakes also have got their time in the spotlight, thanks to the amazing footage of Planet Earth 2 um, that showed these guys hunting on marine iguana hatchlings, which was 
extremely dramatic and, and moving video um, that they managed to capture there. Of course, today we're talking about birds. The seabirds of Galapagos are very special too. It's where there's a penguin there that is very much celebrated with plants, mammals, all kinds of species. Now, this is biodiversity. Every single one of these species has a role in the ecosystem and they all interact with each other too. So the presence of these species and the health of these populations are essential for the health of the ecosystem. Now, ecosystems provide a lot of services. It sounds quite clinical to call it that, but the scientific term is ecosystem services. And what we mean by that is things like the provision of fresh air for us to breathe from photosynthesizing organisms like plants. It's the food that we eat. It's clean water. Basically, everything we need to survive depends on ecosystem health. As we look to the future with the SDG achievements we want to, to see around the world by 2030 and the urgent need for building resilience against potential climate change impacts shows just why we need to be protecting the biodiversity we still have and working as hard as we can to restore and conserve the biodiversity that we've lost. You can see from this slide here that biodiversity loss is a truly global issue and we don't want this talk to be doom and gloom at all but we cannot shy away from the fact that we are in a global biodiversity crisis. The amount of species that we've lost has accelerated significantly over the last 20 years. So this figure is from the Living Planet Report, an amazing document that comes out every four years by the WWF and CETASL teams. This one came out in 2020. Here you can see um, a bunch of data that goes behind these scores to try and measure biodiversity, health and species loss. And I was extremely shocked to see that in 2020, Central and South America had the highest declines in biodiversity health, 94% since the 70s. So there's a, like I said, there's a variety of data that's behind that. That's not 94% of species loss, but it's, severe the situation. The positive thing is though that in many cases we, we know what we can do about it. We're starting to understand more and more the key drivers, habitat loss, overexploitation, so fishing and hunting of species, climate change and the potential impacts, our ability to, to measure what's happening in the fields is improving with technology. We have models that can help us start to predict how these ecosystems might change. And one of the biggest threats, invasive species that we're focusing on tonight, we do have methods to start to control some of these if we have enough resources behind it for the efforts that are going on to try and tackle them. This biodiversity loss is not equal across all habitats. Um, unfortunately, island species are much more vulnerable to extinction. Over 50% of all known animal extinctions in the last 400 years have been on islands. So you can see that that is particularly significant when we look to this next slide, which was kindly shared by Island Conservation Team, who we work very closely with on habitat restoration and invasive species projects, where islands only make up 5.3% of Earth's land mass yet have experienced three quarters of bird, amphibian, mammal and reptile extinctions. 41% of all critically endangered and endangered terrestrial vertebrates that have been assessed are island dwelling. And 19% of bird species depend on islands for their survival too. Another accolade that islands have is their vulnerability to invasive species. 86% of recording ex recorded species extinctions linked to invasives have occurred on islands. So what I guess is my key message here is that we need global efforts to conserve biodiversity. If we want to have maximum impact, we need to be working on islands and particularly in the Central and Southern America, as you could see from that um, earlier map. 
And in terms of priority issues to tackle, invasive species are right up the top. So what do we mean by invasive species? They are non-native species that have been transported by human activities. And species can be introduced and not necessarily be invasive. The definition of invasive means there must be some sort of harm. So whether that's ecological to the ecosystem or economic harm as well. You can see here in this graph from um, a, a journal article from Nature in 2017, the cumulative cost in billions of US dollars for invasive species management around the world over the last 50 years or so. Unexpectedly, mosquitoes are the highest um, because of obvious human health implications as well. But in second and third place are rats and mice species and feral cats, which of course, as Shamin said, are focus um, species for the restoration of Floriana Island. In total, 1,579 species have been introduced to Galapagos that we know about. That's not necessarily all invasive species, many still really need to be studied. But as a selection of the most wanted list, if you like, you can see some here. Agricultural animals such as goats and pigs may have been uh, introduced on purpose for food sources, but they outcompete and predate on um, native wildlife. The rats and cats we've heard about, um, their major impact is eating eggs and hatchlings of, of birds and reptiles in particular. The Annie bird is introduced, was introduced initially for um, cattle management, removing parasites, but now um, there's major concern about their risk as a predator, but also that they um, are a disperser of invasive plant species. And one of our major focuses there is the blackberry, um, which you can see next to that bird. Now. Top right, we've got Calerpa algae. So this is a marine example of an invasive species that Intiquid's team at Charles Darwin Foundation are working hard on. And then we also have insects and mollusks, so wasps, the avon vampire fly, Falonis, that Shami mentioned earlier, and we'll see more on shortly, and the giant African land snail. So science is helping us with this challenge, and this is where GCT um, supporters have been instrumental in helping us to, to go on this journey over at least 15 years we've been working on invasive species management and control. And what we have learned is that we need to take opportunities when we can. Often this is the kind of curve with invasive species that once they are introduced, there's exponential growth and spread, and there's a window when eradication is feasible, past which we're waiting for technology or financial resources to be there to move from long-term management and control of species back to eradication and allowing restoration. Of course, for long-term action, we need to be preventing species from being introduced in the first place. And so biosecurity is hugely important. That's a feature in many of the projects that we support to try and stop these introductions before they happen. So we're here today to think about invasive species and, and island restoration in the context of Galapagos land birds, particularly. So here are the three, three key invasives that I wanted to just um, highlight. Falonis Downsy, you hear a lot about. 10 years ago, in 2012, GCT co-funded the first um, workshop on Falonis in Galapagos with the Charles Darwin Foundation, Galapagos Conservancy, the National Park, and many other actors. We know that this fly was native to Trinidad and Brazil and was probably accidentally introduced in the 60s with fruit and veg cargo shipping is the most likely. The fly now exists on at least 14 islands and the larvae, which you can see on the left, uh, on the slide here, feed on the blood of, of fledged on chicks of at least 18 species, often resulting in complete nestling mortality or at least very high percentage. So a major extinction risk. And we're gonna hear more about the impacts of felonis from Birgit in her talk later. Next up is the blackberry I mentioned earlier, native to Southern Asia. Mora, as it's known locally, 
can grow up to 4.5 meters tall in pretty much impenetrable thickets. And these plants are super prolific. They produce thousands of seeds and germination success is up to 80%. So they're very, very successful invaders all around the world, brambles, blackberries, raspberries. They're very easily spread. Um, this like physical barrier of the brambles affects giant tortoise migrations. We've seen that from, from GCT funded projects, um, as well as impacting bird foraging and suitable habitat for, for birds. We have several management options for, for Mora, which again, I think Birgit will explain a bit more about later. Either physical management of, of you know, physically moving, removing the plants with machetes, chemical management through herbicides, which of course is dangerous due to potential toxicity risks for other species, and then biological management options as well. There's particular types of funguses that may be suitable in the future to manage this. A major focus for islands all around the world is tackling the issue of rats. So they're now found on over 80% of islands around the world, hugely cosmopolitan species now. As I mentioned earlier, they eat the eggs and, and small and young, sorry, of birds and reptiles and outcompete or predate on native rice rats, having caused three extinctions already um, of the native rodent fauna. The social impacts, of course, of rats as well, including on agriculture and human health impacts. So the removal of rats of pin, on Pinzon has been hugely successful. And I think it was just last year or maybe 2020, the first hat, uh, giant tortoise eggs and hatchlings um, appeared on Pinzon for more than 100 years, probably, because they just couldn't mature due to the rat predation. So we, we've seen really positive results of rat removal, which we're hoping to, to um, emulate in the Floriana program. So from those three examples, going back to the, the invasive species curve, we can see that we're hoping that rats are in the eradication area. We think we've seen it's possible in other islets. We're embracing new tech for the methods um, and learning from islands all around the world. For the avian vampire fly and mora, we're in a long-term management phase at the moment, but amazing scientific efforts are going on that we are seeking support to continue to try and learn more about how to control these hugely damaging species and hopefully in the future manage to eradicate them too. I think this assemblage of species here is, is the most poignant reminder I can give of, of why we need to do this. These are the species that are extinct from Floriana Islands that Charmian mentioned earlier. Extinct is not a word I feel that we should be hearing in 2022. We know what we need to do to conserve a lot of these animals and we're ready. We just need the resources behind us, the financial investment, the political will to make this happen because we must avoid any more of these species being lost. The good news is for most of these species, they're not entirely extinct. They're found on other islets and islands around the archipelago. And so we're hoping that um, when the islands are restored, after invasive species are removed, these can start to be reintroduced. So the three major projects that um, GCT are working on at the moment with our amazing partners that you can see listed underneath, the Floriana Restoration Program. The focus for birds there, um, for us historically, since at least 2007, has been the Floriana Mockingbird. Mockingbirds are really important for us, um, particularly with the Charles Darwin link and the UK heritage importance of, of really that um, recognition of how important this group of species are for our fundamental understanding of evolution and how we fit into the, the puzzle of life. So mockingbirds have been a focus species for us for many years. Um, Luis Ortiz has led this work. I think hopefully he's in the audience. Um, we've been collaborating for, for a very long time to study the tiny population that's left of these birds in the hope that we will have successful reintroduction of them in the next few years. 
The other part of the Floriana Restoration Program is mitigation for the native species during the eradication event, so for owls and finches, and that's what Roland is going to be um, speaking about very shortly. The Vermilion Flycatcher Project um, is a really exciting one that's led by Birgit, who is going to explain more about that, and the Mangrove Finch Project is also linked with the Lambert's Program of, of CDF, so Birgit will touch on this really important project too. As I mentioned with Pinzon, we saw this amazing um, result of the tortoises starting to successfully um, recover from the impact of rats. We have a super exciting opportunity this year, year for the very first time to potentially reintroduce a Darwin's finch to, a, to an island that was its, in its historic range. This has never been successfully done before in Galapagos. Um, there's been translocation trials uh, within the same island, but never inter island. For those of you who aren't Spanish speakers, I think it's really cool that Pinzon means finch. And so it's ultimately the first Darwin's finch to be reintroduced to an island it will be on Finch Island, which is so perfect. This is a project that we're really focusing on um, with the, our appeal currently that Charmian mentioned. So if you are able and interested to help us support this really groundbreaking project, we'd be hugely grateful for anything that you can um, give. So just to sum up uh, my part, what can you do um, to help us in this mission? So firstly, if you're in Galapagos, clean your boots. This is a selfie of me or my boots and look at all those seeds that were attached. Excuse the undone shoelace, hopefully my mom's not in the audience looking that scruffy on a work trip, but you can see just how many seeds uh, collect over a short walk. Now in Galapagos, it's hugely important to clean your kit if you're moving from island to island or before you go there. And I don't know if everybody knows that when um, science teams go to the very remote islands in Galapagos, they have to be very careful even of what they eat before they go, in case seeds pressed in feces can um, actually, you know, start populations on these remote islands. So please consider what you're taking with you when you're moving around. Second, I said already, please donate if you're able to. Um, such exciting work is happening. Um, and yeah, we need as much support as we can get. And third, please get involved with citizen science and raising awareness about invasive species. CDF have done amazing guides for people if you're going to Galapagos to keep an eye out. Um, also in the UK, it's, invasive species are a huge issue too. So please um, stay up to date with this really important issue. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. Um, I'm now going to introduce, firstly, a short video which um, contains some of our other uh, partners on the islands to hear from them why they believe that protecting the bird species of Galapagos is important. And then straight after that, we're going to go to Roland Digby's uh, presentation. As Shamian mentioned, Roland is the Floriana Mitigation Officer with Dural Wildlife Conservation Trust. Has an extensive background in agriculture. Um, right now is in Madagascar doing some really important work on endangered uh, bird species out there. So really looking forward to seeing um, what Roland has to say. Thanks. Galapagos lambirds are very unique. Most of the species are found here only in the Galapagos and nowhere else in the world. In addition to that, each species has a special role in the ecosystem and allow the ecosystems of the Galapagos to continue to thrive. Communities in the Galapagos depend on tourism and a lot of the people or the major driver of tourism is actually lambirds. A lot of people come here just to see the famous Darwin finches that help uh, Darwin with the theory of evolution. And so protecting these species is very key, not only for the ecosystems, but also for the communities of the Galapagos. Hola, soy Karen Vera, entomóloga de la Fundación Charles Darwin, donde protegemos a las aves terrestres por su importancia en roles ecológicos y servicios ecosistémicos que nos proporcionan. Las aves terrestres ayudan a mantener el equilibrio de los ecosistemas, 
brindan beneficios claves como polinizadores, también ayudan en la dispersión de semillas y muchas son insectívoras y mantienen el equilibrio en la población de insectos. Hi, my name is Luis Ortiz Catedral, and I think it's important to conserve the birds of the Galapagos Islands not only because of their huge importance in the development of biological science, but also because we can. We are at a time in history where we can intervene and successfully prevent the extinction of these wonderful species, and in doing so, develop techniques that can be applied elsewhere in the world. Good evening and thank you for attending. My name is Roland Digby and I am the Floriana Mitigation Officer for Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust. My main role has been to develop techniques for us to be able to safely hold captive populations of each of the five Darwin species found in Floriana during the eradication plan for 2023. The mitigation trials were held between December 2018 and November 2019. There were five key objectives with the Lowland trial being held first. The first objective, identify the maximum numbers of birds that can be held together in a single aviary. Identify the correct diets for each species. Identify the correct husbandry methods for each of the species and if any of the five species can be held in mixed aviaries. Identify a safe release method and confirm that the birds readapt to a life in the wild after their time in captivity. Finally, train members of national park staff in all aspects of capture, husbandry and to the day-to-day -day management of the birds. In total, 141 Darwin's finch of four species were trapped, with 127 being selected for the captive holding trial. Any thin or diseased bird trapped were immediately released to help identify the species and ensure they were fitted with the correct rings, biometric measurements were taken of the bill, wings and tarsus. We were able to answer all five of our questions and identify some very diligent national park staff with a real flair for aviculture. It wasn't all plain sailing though, and there were plenty of difficulties to overcome. In total, 15 recommendations were made for the Highland Trials, with the main four being. We needed to improve health management, and we needed to be able to analyse and store samples in situ on Floriana. Previous to this, during the Lowland Trial, we had been reliant on sending samples to Santa Cruz for analysis. This was slow and laborious, and it prevented us from dealing with problems in real time. We needed to develop a slower and more controlled quarantine method. We had been too focused on how many birds could be held in each aviary and how we would look after them rather than actually how could we bring them safely into captivity. And therefore, we needed to make changes to our husbandry protocol. This is um, quite normal and this is one of the reasons that you hold a captive holding trial rather than going straight into the mitigation itself. We needed to also sample the wild population of Darwin's finches on Floriana for parasites and pathogens so as to preempt any problems that might occur both during the Highland trial and later on during the mitigation itself. Having learned about the husbandry of small and medium ground finches in the lowland trials we focused on the small tree finch and the endemic medium tree finch which is critically endangered and found only in the highlands of Floriana. In total we trapped 80 birds but only held 58. Species presented new challenges being far more insectivorous than the ground finches as did the climate. We needed to rethink aviary design. The ventilation system that worked so well in the hot and dry lowlands made the aviaries very cold and drafty in the cool climate of the highlands. This was especially so during August and September, which was the Garua season, when the highlands of Floriana are draped in a cold, damp fog. 
The quarantine process also needed to be redesigned, with the birds being very difficult to bring into captivity at first, and it was only through trial and error that we managed to develop an effective captive holding protocol. None of this would have been possible without our field lab. This was important as it allowed us to monitor and control the levels of internal parasites in the birds. Our key achievements were as follows. Three of the four questions were comprehensively answered, although more post-release monitoring was required. This, however, was planned for March 2020. The training of the Galapagos National Park Guards was progressing to plan and those that had already shown a flair for aviculture were improving in leaps and bounds. Good relationships have been built with partners and with the local community. In this photograph, we see Paula from Island Conservation speaking to the local school children. The children really enjoyed coming to the releases and they loved to count the birds as they left the aviaries. A mitigation plan had been agreed with all partners and written. The original plan was to return at the end of February 2020 to prepare for the eradication, which included aviary extensions and a refit. However, World Defence changed that, but I was able to return at the end of 2020 and by April 2021, the work on the aviaries was completed. In addition to the work on the aviaries, by the end of July 2021, we had completed the post-release monitoring. Both highland and lowland finch populations had been monitored. The lowland results were good, with over 30% of the birds released in 2019 being reobserved. Due to the late time of year, and a different monitoring method required, the numbers of tree finches reobserved in the highlands were lower. However, reobservations of healthy medium tree and small tree finches were made, and we could therefore ascertain that the birds could be held in captivity and safely readapt to life in the wild. As well as our work on Floriana, Galapagos Conservation Trust is helping to fund another rewilding project which will indirectly help our work to rewild Floriana. We have been developing a translocation plan along with Island Conservation and the Galapagos National Park to translocate woodpecker finches from the transitional zones and dry zones of Santa Cruz to Pinzon Island. A number of specimens were collected from Pinzone during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, with the last breeding observations occurring during the late 1960s and early 1970s, although the, by then the species was recorded as rare. The last confirmed observation being 2012. Rats have now been eradicated since 2014 and the giant tortoises are again successfully breeding, fulfilling their role as a keystone species on the island and modifying the environment for the better. This translocation is both important in restoring lost species to Pinzone and improving biodiversity, as well as initially allowing us to trial the techniques that will be needed when returning locally extinct species of passerine to Floriana after the eradication in 2023. Our work doesn't stop after the eradication. There are 13 locally extinct species of birds and reptiles on Floriana. Feasibility assessments and reintroduction plans have been developed and we will be holding a workshop on Floriana in July with a range of scientists, conservation practitioners and members of the local community to plan the best course of action to restore them all to the island. 
Again, with generous funding from Galapagos Conservation Trust, we have been able to commission the Charles Darwin Foundation to carry invertebrate surveys in the highlands of Floriana, focusing both in the agricultural zone and the national park, with the aim of identifying suitable release sites for vermilion flycatcher and other insectivorous species like the grey warbler finch. This work is important as we cannot reintroduce species unless we know the environment can support them. Additionally, the funding provided by Galapagos Conservation Trust is improving capacity in the archipelago through the continued employment and career development of a Galapagena entomologist. Thank you all for listening and we're keeping our fingers crossed for 2023. Great, thank you very much, Roland. Um, as Roland said, we're very hopeful of 2023, so that is when we are hoping that the rat eradication will go ahead probably in the autumn of next year. So all fingers crossed as we're working up to that really, really important crux point for the, this program. Now I've got the pleasure of introducing Birgit Fessel, coordinator of the Galapagos Lambert Conservation Plan at the Charles Darwin Foundation. Known Birgit for many years. She's super inspiring the work of her and her team, what they've achieved um, through the Land Bird Conservation Plan. She's been studying land birds for over 20 years and has extensive experience in ecology, bird monitoring, and also in controlling Fulonis Down Sea, um, the invasive fly that we spoke about earlier. So thanks so much for joining us, Birgit. Handing over to you. Um, I would like to talk about the Galapagos Land Bird Conservation Project, which is a joint project between the Charles Darwin Foundation and the Galapagos National Park. Um, it is um, on since 2014 and it can only, it's only possible to the engagement and uh, dedication of many people involved. Um, okay, sorry, I wanted to go further. Well, there aren't that many different land birds in the Galapagos, 29 species, including and introduced the smooth bilani, um, but they're very spe spe special, huh? as mentioned before, and we do know really a lot of details for some of them. However, when we started the project, we had to admit that we don't even know how many birds are on each island, and we didn't even know if the number of species is still the same than in the first observations quite long ago. So one of the key stone activities of the Land Bird Project was to, uh, to give a baseline data, which is just crucial for any follow-up conservation project. And please don't be frightened when you see such a graph. It's quite easy to, to read. So each bar is an island. And um, here you can see the number of <clears throat> bird species you can find on the island. So if it is blue, all is good. If it is yellow, red, or black, uh, then we have a problem. Let's see, here's Floriana. You could have found historically 16 species. We have six that are stable. We have another four that are in decline, and the other ones are already extinct. And what you also can see on this um, graph is that the most declines, extinctions, or very rare species are on the four inhabited islands. Indeed, 40% of the land populations are declining or have become extinct on the inhabited islands. And over 70% of these declines have happened over the last 40 years. So it's not nothing that, uh, that's historically, it's really related to human activity. I would like to talk a little bit more about, uh, yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> what most of the species have in common is that they are insectivorous and have small clutch sizes. One of these species is the little vermilion flycatcher. You've heard about it. Nice, pretty uh, bird. Has already disappeared from Floriana and San Cristobal and is in sharp decline on Santiago and Santa Cruz. We have started to work with this bird in 2015, however, on Isabella because it was already too rare in Santa Cruz. And we could find what are the key threats for this species. Actually, it's the uh, avian vampire fly. 
This species is incredibly sensitive to a parasitism. Already 15 larvae are too much and the chicks would die. However, in Santa Cruz, there is another problem. The availability and accessibility of food is super important for the incubating female. So what happened there is that the females had their nests, they sit on the eggs for two weeks, then they left the nest, started a new nest, put eggs, and so forth. And there was not a single Philonis larvae in the nest. So what is happening here is that these birds don't have access to their preferred food sources. They are sit and wait predators and they love to hunt to the ground where they're the big prey, like spiders, caterpillars, or crickets. But what's happening in the Mina Granilla Rojo, where the, the last refuge of the little population of 30 birds is, is that blackberry has completely replaced the native and endemic vegetation. And you could see here with this person, actually quite a tall guy. So it's a, a wall of blackberry. And birds just can't hunt here. They are forced to hunt high up and they get lower praise, uh, praise of lower um, value, if you want to say. The park agreed to start an experimental management that was back in 2018. And it uh, it was, um, it's, it's super level. So what we are doing, and that's new, but the park gardens and uh, contracted workers, they're removing manually, so without chemicals, the blackberry. And they have to do that over and over again because uh, they had lots of seeds and the mora is coming back. So this is how a plot would look after about two years. You could see the little vermilion flycatcher is all happy. He can hunt wherever he wants to. There's also nice regrowth of scalacea and other native birds, uh, native, native plants. And the females continued to sit on their nests and actually the chicks hatch. And once the chick hatch, so that we don't get into the problems we already knew from Isabella with the, with the Philonis, we are using a technique that was developed on other Darwin finches before, which is a nest injection with insecticide. So the idea here is um, that you put an insecticide in the nest bottom where the Philonis larvae are, are spending their days uh, and the insecticide does not touch nor the eggs nor the chick or the incubating female. This is this works fine. It's a little bit height limited. We can do up to nests in seven meters. And we additionally trial with self fumigation. So here the idea is that the birds take back material that is impregnated with a specific insecticide to the nest. And um, the larvae, when they go up in the night to feed on the chicks, they pass through this specific larva, larvae site. It's called Suromacina, which we're using at the moment, and they die. Um, well, it works. Um, so we had six chicks in the first year, eight chicks uh, last year. And this year we had number five. I have to say that the season was a bit shorter because La Nina was very uh, was very um, present this year and the uh, nesting started later. We have a couple of more to come eventually. And uh, we are super happy that the park agreed to, to continue with this project and also to open more plots where we have pairs that, that that's unsuccessful because it was just more all over. All successful nests were in the plots that are freed from, um, uh, from aura and all were also treated with insecticide. So, which means we will really need the double approach here. And we would like to thank the Galapagos Conservation Trust and our, all our donors for the year-long support. Without um, these supports, we couldn't conserve and preserve this, this species. Another project where Galapagos Conservation Trust is helping since years is the Mango Finch project that has started in 2006. As you have heard before, it's the rarest bird in the Galapagos. There are fewer than 20 breeding pairs. It can, it has the main threats, um, like the eggs are eaten up by black rat, and then the chicks are killed by the avian vampire fly. Indeed, we do have incredible high numbers of fly larvae in the nest, 40 to 60, and if not treated, an extremely high nesting mortality. What makes this species so complicated to protect is uh, that it is 
has a very restricted range. Actually, it's found on two little mangrove spots. Here you can see them. Uh, in Isabella, quite on the north, it's far off uh, human population, which is nice. However, black rat, philoanes, and cats are plentiful there. The team, which is actually quite out right now, is camping here. No hot shower, no fridge. So quite basic conditions and trying to give the best to protect the species. Unfortunately, climate change also seems to kick in and we see some dieback of these mangroves. This we are going to look into more details in the next years. Because uh, the nest injection was not available then, we did uh, four years of head starting to increase the wild population, so kind of circumvent Philoanes infestation. That's super laborious. Um, we had good successes, but mixed. And after four years, we decided that in situ conservation is better, as parents are the better teachers for these young birds to be released back to the forest. In situ conservation is using the same techniques that are used or that are developed in Santa Cruz. So you can't experiment once you're in the field there. You have to do what, what you know that works. However, nest injection, as you can see, is incredibly challenging there. You, it involves tree climbing. The nests are 15 to 20 meters high. People need to be extremely skilled and experimented for safety for themselves and the birds. We had very good successes in the first years. Unfortunately, the COVID pandemic really um, hit this project heavily. First, in the first year, with the unexpected and very sudden closure of the study sites, so the nests could not be protected, and then stand the ongoing travel restrictions for the core team with the highest experience. So, coming from New Zealand, and New Zealand is just a no go, nobody can leave. The team is anyway doing their best, and they're also trialing alternative methods that we are testing all the time in Santa Cruz on other species, like the self fumigation and also feeding tables. And I'm very curious to hear the results when the team is coming back actually tomorrow after more than eight weeks in the field. What is the take home message? Well, I think it's crucial that the control of the avian vampire fly is pushed forward. Um, there's a big team working on continuously finding new short-term and long-term solutions. Um, and this needs to be ongoing. It is also important to see all these projects as a holistic management. So Pilones is one, one, mm, one piece of it. Uh, you, you, need a, you need to um, reduce the invitation of the avian vampire fly. But you also have to do at the same time control invasive species. These are rodents or the smooth bidani. You have to try to restore the habitat. You have to evaluate the population regularly and the efficiency of the methods. So something that works for one species might not work for the other. Uh, remember what Roland has said with the, um, with the cages and the husbandry guidelines from lowlands to highlands. So it's super important that there is an auto-evaluation it's of the management plan. Genetic diversity also plays its role in other health issues. Finally, we want to increase the range of the species that they're getting more um, uh, less sensitive for any other um, changes with climate change, whatever. And this holds for the vermilion flycatcher, but it also goes for the mangrove finch project and same for any of the project, conservation project, bird conservation project and working together, the different institutions, learning from each other is super important and key. Thank you very much. Exactly, and maybe I can come in there and just say thank you to our three speakers. I don't know about those on the call here, but for, I find getting an understanding of sort of really how these projects work and the details of that, the questions that have to be answered, um, and the challenges of climbing up trees, to, et cetera, it's, it's fascinating. So thank you for sharing that with us. And I'm also, you know, so excited by this idea that if in Floriana we can do what we've talked about there, that will be, you know, really a first in terms of a large tropical inhabited island uh, where we're managing to restore species. So just to, we only have a few moments, oh, we've got nine minutes to answer a few questions. So uh, thank you, the panel have, have come back. Um, 
There were a couple of questions on the chat already. Um, let me just go to one of those. I think one was around, uh, you know, how long will it take to eradicate the rats uh, in Floriana? So I think that one perhaps goes to Jen. Uh, I don't know if you'd like to address that, Jen. Yes, well, I think, um, well, maybe between Roland and myself, because Roland is, is very linked with the Team 30. Um, we, there'll be several um, campaigns, if you like, for the, the eradication. I believe that the, the um, baiting is planned to take place over two to three months. Is that correct, Roland? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, it's, yeah. um, it's two to three months. It goes, it's about two months probably. It's sort of at the point of the year when there was the least possible food on Floriana. So the first drops are the rodent drops. Um, and I think it's three drops in total. So to say I'm, I'm with the mitigation, um, but there'll be three drops of bait. Um, for for the rodents which should do the rats and the mice that should also sort of take out about 80 percent of the cats the feral cats and then you follow up um with um specific drops for the cats as well once the rodents are gone so yeah it's about i think it's best part of three months by the time everything's done and then obviously you're following that up there's a lot of survey work you can't just sort of sit on your laurels, you know, there's, there's still ongoing work that carries on after that. Thank you for that. There was also a question from Dolores around, can herbicides be blamed for the decrease in the number of the vermilion flycatchers um, on Santa Cruz? That's perhaps for, for Birgit. Yes. Um, no, I don't think so. We were um, thinking about this uh, as well. I mean, of course, the herbicide and pesticide use in the agriculture zone is problematic. It's much too much is used. And of course, it impacts the um, invertebrate community, which is, again, important for this insectivorous bird. But um, we would expect then other insectivorous species also to decline further. It might have impacted it a little bit, but um, we do think there is more relation to diseases eventually too, because for example, they might be susceptible to boxes and box is transmitted most by mosquitoes and they are lower down. And the other one is Philonis. Philonis doesn't like it cold. So Philonis uh, comes to the higher areas later in the year. That's also why in Isabella Sierra Negra, for example, birds can reproduce fine in November, December, when it's garua and cold and no flies, but they can't without any help in January, February. So certainly better not to use herbicides, but not the main factor, certainly. Very good. And a question about the blackberries. Um, and does continuous cutting back of blackberries eventually kill the plants, or will they keep growing back, I guess is the implication. I don't know if that's Roland or Jen, who's in the best place to answer oh. that one? Or bigger? They eventually kill the plants. Which plant? The blackberry plant? Blackberry plant, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, what they're doing is they, they have special tools and they pull them out with the root. So, yes, definitely. Because you, um, you're not cutting it. Uh, only cutting it, it just it needs too long. So it's much better you cut it the first time because it's just spines everywhere. And then whatever comes back, then you take it from the root. And all the new seedlings that come out, you take it from the root. And that's how bit by bit you're reducing the seed bank. It would take, Hank would say, eight years. <laughs> they can be, uh, live up to eight years, those seeds. Uh, so you would have to go back to the areas in every three to four months and pull out all the new um, moras before they can make flowers and fruits. But possible, very laborious, but possible. And another question on eradication. This is the eradication of cats. And the question is to whether there are any advances in how we do this, I guess, instead of the, the, the pellets that you were describing, Roland. Um, yeah, there's, um, it's a different bait. So again, this is, it's not my area of expertise, but um, so the cats initially, it's secondary poisoning. 
with the uh, rats being killed by the Brody Falcon. Um, and then obviously they're, they're picking them up easily. Um, but then after that, it's, it's like a sausage. So the, the poison, it's a different poison. I can't remember which um, the name is off the top of my head, but it's in a dried sausage. Um, so they, they drop sausages. Um, it will be done by drone. And that should hopefully get the last of the cats. Then you follow up. You have specially trained dogs. Um, I think these usually come from New Zealand, um, the Department of Conservation doc. Um, are sort of very advanced in their, their predator removal, um, obviously, because they have so many problems that they have to deal with, with all of their flightless, flightless birds and endemic species as well. So we will be getting um, specially trained dogs in at the very end, which would be able to sort of sniff out the whole island for any last stragglers. Just to um, pick up on uh, Roland's point about the drones there, that's really exciting um, new technology as well for these kind of projects, whereas previously we would have had to rely on helicopters, which of course are extremely expensive and a massive carbon footprint. But now what drones are allowing us to do is hopefully to, to carry out these projects with a lower environmental footprint themselves as well. And maybe one last question here, which I think is interesting when we think about, you know, inhabited islands and, you know, domestic pets, cats and dogs and so forth. You know, what, what is the plan for that in somewhere like Floriana or, you know, places where we're trying to restore habitat? Um, yeah, so this year, actually, we're working really closely with um, Island Conservation and Hokutaka, two NGOs there, um, to deliver uh, the pet sterilization campaign in Floriana. So most of the, the pet cats and dogs are already sterilized. Um, the community has been engaged in this program from the very beginning. So something to highlight also, um, I think Project Floriana is just a massive testament to collaboration and coordination and really putting the community at the center of the design of these kind of programs, which is essential for them to work. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, look, thank you to once again to, to all our guests tonight. And, you know, what I hope people have taken away from tonight is that, you know, there really are things that, that can be done and that are being done. Um, we do rely upon support from, from people like yourself. So please, if you can, do donate. Um, but we hope above all that you found this evening interesting and informative. If you have further questions, do feel free to direct them to GCT and, and we will answer those. So thank you very much and have a good evening. Bye-bye.